Good morning, afternoon or evening, wherever in the world you are watching on this World Consumer Rights Day. Uh, welcome to our session today. I'm delighted that you've chosen to spend the next hour and a half with us. And we've got a really packed lineup with some of the most uh, exciting, distinguished speakers um, you will find on this area. Um, my name is Joe Tan and I'm the Pro Bono Legal Manager at Advocates for International Development, or A4ID as it's sometimes known. Um, A4ID is a charity headquartered in London with uh, regional offices soon to be opening in Nairobi and New Delhi. We've been, we were founded in 2006 and we work at the intersection of law and, and development. We um, find lawyers um, to assist and advise NGOs, um, and more recently, developing country governments, uh, legal professional associations, and intergovernmental organizations like the World Bank and UN agencies to ensure that those engaged in the fight against global poverty have access to the best pro bono lawyers in the world. And lawyers um, are able to access meaningful work um, that's going to make a real impact and difference on eradicating poverty. Um, I'll introduce you now, before I introduce you to uh, our first speaker, I thought I would quickly just go through the rundown of the, the program. Um, first up, we've got uh, Jamie Sori uh, from Gala, Global Alliance for Legal Aid, who will be giving you a quick rundown of this really exciting global research project that we've just embarked on. Um, that'll be followed by a presentation from David Locke, the CEO and Chief Ombudsman at the Australian Financial Complaints Authority. Um, he's in Australia, so couldn't really join us today, but has given us a pre-recorded uh, presentation. We'll then go into a moderated discussion with uh, some of our speakers, as you can see on the list there. And a short Q&A at the end, we have some time, uh, we'll have about 10 minutes or so before wrapping things up. So um, without any further ado, I think we can move on to uh, Jamie's presentation now. Jamie. Good morning. Thank you, Joe. And thanks to Consumers International for allowing us to take part in World Consumer Rights Day. So our session today is going to be on how financial consumer protection in the age of digital lending uh, intersects with some research that we did, GALA and A4ID supported by DLA Piper. We looked at East African economies and we tried to understand what happens to a poor person who is over indebted and what is, how does the legal framework treat that person? Next slide, please. So today we have quite a packed session. I'm gonna speak very quickly, uh, apologies for that. What we are going to do is to give some really high level um, insights on the legal frameworks and how they impact uh, poor persons who may also be over indebted. So we'll be looking at legal frameworks for financial consumer protection. We'll be looking at uh, debt exit strategies in the form of insolvency and how digital loans uh, may be actually aggravating the situation for some poor and vulnerable consumers. We'll give you some outputs from our research today and know that this is ongoing research, so there are some more outputs expected along the way. What we have done at this point is some high-level uh, infographics with regard to the four East African countries, so Burundi, Tanzania, Uganda, and Kenya. What will come out starting as April in a rolling format are full narrative reports on the situation. Um, we also have published already some draft guidelines these are suggestions about and recommendations about how we believe debt policies and relief for natural persons should be um, in order to protect human rights of debtors. And in the future, we're also looking to do some in-country projects to help debtors that are in debt distress. So predominantly looking at countries where we've had a, quite a lot of support from the consumer sector, um, as well as legal aid programs, particularly in Kenya and in India. Then after me, as Joe noted, we'll hear from uh, Mr. David Locke, who's the chief ombudsman with AFCA. And we chose his um, intervention in particular because Australia has a huge volume of financial consumer complaints and AFCA has the particular mandate, the express mandate of helping debtors who are in debt distress. 
So next slide, please. So the topic today, just to provide some background, we're gonna talk about how digital loans may be contributing to debt distress for the poor and most vulnerable. What we have is a situation in developing countries where the super majority of workers really are day laborers working in the informal sector. <clears throat> Excuse me, so the informal sector is the predominant employer with upwards of 80 and 90% of all of the jobs coming from that sector. And that means that incomes are very low they're unreliable and they're sporadic. In fact, in the four countries that we looked at, the average uh, GDP per capita is less than 1,000 US dollars. So what happens then is that uh, people who can't pay for all of their recurring expenses, such as food, utilities, medical costs, and school fees, they're actually using very accessible loans to supplement their household um, revenues and, and to pay for these regularly occurring expensive expenses. However, the loans that they're taking, even though they're easily accessible, may not be affordable for them. They're very high interest, they're short term, and they're expensive, which ultimately result in longer term problems for the poor. So we'll get into that later when we share with you the legal uh, framework and the gaps. Next slide, please. So what is also happening is that Oh, no, previous, previous slide, sorry. What is also happening is that a large percentage of this meeting is being recorded. Got some feedback here. Is everybody hearing that awful ringing that I'm hearing? Yes. Just wanted to wake you up this afternoon. I think we have an echo too, but I'll, I'll continue. Maybe not. Can you hear me? Um, Jamie, do you want to try again? Yeah, not sure what's happening with the sound. message in the chat so hello everyone i think there's some feedback issues with your uh device jamie um it seems to be coming from yours and when you when you move then it gets a little bit better um i don't know if you're not logged on, on two devices yeah i'm only connected to one Joe, uh, in the interest of time, do you want to continue? Maybe, Jamie, if you turn your uh, turn your phone right, turn it right off, perhaps. Is that? Now try. Um, okay. I mean, like turn it right, like completely turn, close it down. Okay, is it better okay, now? Okay, now? Yeah, on my 
my other gadgets are shut off. Thanks, Kamira. Everything's off, so I'm not quite sure what's going on. Can everyone else mute? I'm hearing a lot of echoes now. Now it's gone. Are we good? Are we good? Are we good? Are we good? Uh, the echo is still there. The, um... Okay. Okay. Uh, Joe, why don't you continue? Because this echo is super annoying. Yeah. Okay. So, um, where are we now? Um, did you want me, Jamie, to start? Uh, with the moderated panel? Or should we go to David? Perhaps, um, Perhaps if we play uh, David's uh, tape, or um, I can take over. So um, we, um, as, as Jamie was saying, um, we've undertaken this study across close to 35 countries. Um, it's still an ongoing process. Uh, we've just, uh, we've got uh, DLA Piper assisting us in Africa. Um, we've got a number of Asian countries. For the first time, we've added uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, and we also uh, have uh, taken MENA. We started this uh, research in 2016, um, and uh, we've since expanded it um, in this particular iteration. Um, if you'd like to go to the next slide, please. Can so, you an echo, Joe? Sorry. I think it's gone now. Oh, success. I can take over. So sorry. Okay. Right. So sorry about that, everyone. I think there was some interference with my phone. Um, what we looked at in regards to the legal analysis is what is the architecture of the financial consumer protection look like in terms of laws and regulations? Um, what sort of financial market conduct is being monitored, in particular with regard to debt collection and over indebtedness? Um, is there any debt relief that's available to consumers who are natural persons? Okay, we can move down, please. In particular, what we found in East Africa, and again, these are really high level findings, is that there is um, definitely financial consumer protection legal gaps. So Kenya, for example, does not have financial consumer protection law. It has some prudential guidelines, um, some consumer protection language tucked in as prudential guidelines, but at the moment that's only applicable for the licensed banks. There are of course some proposed regulations that are out in the public domain now for comment, um, and that would give the central bank some powers to regulate credit providers in terms of setting interest rate caps, and also um, a ban definitely on some of these data privacy abuses and abusive collection protect practices that we're seeing. Um, however, the central bank has indicated that it has no intention of setting interest rate caps. So Uganda has some financial consumer protection guidelines, but those do not have any force of law. So when you have, um, when you're without this applicable, applicable legal framework, what happens is the market conduct and predatory lending practices and debt collection abuses go virtually unchecked. In Burundi and Tanzania, are actually financial consumer protection regulations, but there is weak market conduct supervision. Okay, next slide, please. Digital loans, um, as we mentioned before, are really, really quite expensive. And this impacts the fact that um, the over indebtedness levels are not being monitored. So just to give you an idea of some of the pricing, we found a survey had been done by the Competition Authority in Kenya together with Innovations in Poverty Action. And they found that the effective APR was over 280% for a small loan to a probably poor 
uh, individual. In Uganda and Tanzania, we've also seen that the lending, um, the leading services providers are also charging very high rates, usually 9% per month. Um, and that, that comes out to be a 108% APR if you don't think about late fees. So usually what happens is people have difficulty paying on time and they incur larger fees in terms of late fees tacked on. Um, digital fees, like we've mentioned, also have high default rates. Per our own survey, talking with some borrowers in the, in the marketplace, 59% couldn't repay their digital loans on time. And 57% of those persons also had other loans. So not only are they taking out these digital loans, they're also getting loans from banks, from SACOs, from co-ops, and also from money lenders. And as we've noted, paying late means paying more. Um, there's also the potential to be added to a credit registry blacklist. If your name gets put on that blacklist, you will have to pay the debt and pay an additional fee to get a clearance uh, certificate to get off the blacklist. So in Kenya, that would be about 20 US dollars. Um, in the countries that we surveyed, only Kenya, as we mentioned, has a definition for over indebtedness. But the important factor here is that these consumer and personal loans are getting to be um, very large and significant portions of all lending. So close to 30% of all lending is consumer loans. Next slide, please. And access to dispute resolution is really inadequate in all of the countries, but for Uganda. So what we're seeing is that there's no independent financial ombudsman, mediator, arbiter. Um, we think that there should be, and we'll hear from David Locke about why this figure is very important to resolving consumer complaints. Um, but it also can be used to look at the issue of over indebtedness. So we see, for example, in Uganda, the volume of consumer complaints is over 260,000 in one year. Um, and 74% of those complaints were for men. Why? We don't know. So this really also highlights why data can be a very important tool. Uh, data about complaints handling can inform regulatory policy making, and it can provide the evidence base for intervention when necessary. Next slide, please. So the heart of our research was on insolvency and debt relief. And essentially, this is very, very um, high level, but there's no debt relief in the form of an insolvency or bankruptcy that's really in practice available for the poor. Um, legislation is really complex. In most cases, you need a licensed insolvency practitioner to help you. And in some cases, like in Kenya, there's even a minimum level of debt that you need to have in order to proceed with a bankruptcy filing. Um, so essentially, the law is there but it was really passed with the intent to help corporations restructure and with the creditor uh, idea of creditor protection in mind. It wasn't at all designed to help people with no assets and only debts. Next slide, please. So this is also um, really, really important from our findings is that in a lot of the countries, including places where we didn't expect um, it's possible as a negative consequence of default to find yourself in um, hot water such that you are actually in danger of being incarcerated. So Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda have civil procedure that is live, meaning the laws are still active, um, which could allow for incarceration of a debtor. In Burundi, this is the shining star of the area. It's not legal to incarcerate somebody just for a default on a civil loan. So the issue too is that Going to jail, of course, is very traumatic, uh, but it doesn't absolve the underlying debt. So the person who is in debt default and incarcerated can come out of jail with more debt and perhaps have had even lost um, their means of, of earning income while they were incarcerated. So in Kenya and Uganda, we found actual statistics showing that there are people in jail for this, this reason, um, 648 persons to be precise in Kenya in 2019, and that number went down to 200 in 2020. Similarly, we saw uh, decreases in the numbers of, of consumers in jail for this reason. And we think that COVID has something to do with it because there was a lot of releases from prisons uh, due to trying to deal with the overcrowding issue and the health consequences of COVID. Um, other challenges related to uh, this obviously bad practice from, from our perspective is that um, it has a lot of negative socioeconomic consequences on the family structure children could potentially be jailed with um, a mother. And keep in mind that even all these, these numbers, 200 or 
uh, some persons incarcerated may seem like a small volume. There's actually large populations of people in prison in East Africa who are on remand status. And remand is this limbo whereby you've been arrested, but you haven't been formally charged or sentenced. So there is no way uh, for us to know whether or not they're actually debtors who have been arrested and jailed uh, because they're not really counted. So you see that in Uganda, there's about 34,000 people in this remand status, Kenya 56,000 and Tanzania approximately 15,000. So remand in, in and of itself could last for a period of years of incarceration. Next slide, please. So what are we um, suggesting here? We have some very important, we think, suggestions for the global community and on how to change debt policies such that they're more respectful of human rights. And these are available on our website, so I'm not going to read them all to you also because of my time and IT glitch. Uh, but essentially, we're calling for an abolition of the practice of incarcerating debtors. We would like to see more simplified um, debt relief practices practices and procedures available to help these people who are in um, a situation of debt insolvency that they can't get out of. And we also believe that countries should consider adding a figure of a financial ombudsman, mediator, um, or ADR type financial dispute resolution facility. Next slide, please. So all of the infographics per country are available on the debt policy site for you to view. Um, if you just switch to the next slide briefly, I can share what an infographic looks like. Um, essentially, we've highlighted some of the demographic indicators. Kenyans, 36% live on less than $2 a day. Um, you have a high financial inclusion rate, but you have a big disparity between that rate and the financial literacy level. So essentially, that could mean that you have a large population of people using or having access to financial services, but not necessarily appreciating the terms and conditions or being able to assess the risk of that product use. Um, and then in the center here, you see we've highlighted that Kenya is a signatory of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which through Article 11 means that they've agreed they won't incarcerate people just because they can't fulfill a contractual obligation. Uh, but yet the law is still active whereby you can go to jail for not paying your debts. Um, essentially no financial consumer protection law as of yet, no supervision of debt collector collectors and no um, financial dispute resolution facility. Um, I should mention that in, in the East African countries, you can go to the central bank, uh, but as one Burundian lawyer put it, the likelihood of a poor consumer going to um, the central bank is close to zero. Okay, back to the last slide, please. Okay, so sorry for the IT glitches. If you want to know more about this, we're really happy to talk to you. We've got uh, Mr. David Locke up next, who's the Chief Ombudsman of the AFCA Financial Complaints Authority. Thank you. Into it with my first question, can you tell us a bit more about um, AFCA's origins and its mandate with regard to assisting indebted consumers and how that came to be? Yes, certainly. So AFCA was established just over three years ago on the 1st of November, 2018 as the single uh, external dispute resolution or ombudsman scheme for the financial services sector in Australia. Um, there's been EDR schemes for about 30 years in Australia, um, but um, there's been various amalgamations of those over that period of time. We were established um, to determine what is fair in all the circumstances of a case and to work with the parties to a dispute to try and resolve those matters. And, and that involves any consumer who has a dispute with a bank, with a credit provider, um, with a, an insurer, financial advisor, uh, or other financial services firm. Um, a, a, a significant proportion of the work that we do is really working as well with people who are in financial hardship, financial difficulty. And in Australia, since 2009, there has been national consumer credit protections in place. And part of those protections is a code of conduct that requires all financial services firms to offer financial hardship assistance to consumers in difficulty. So when we are looking at a matter, uh, we also look at whether that code is being complied with. So if a consumer is in financial difficulty, we are able to 
uh, look to see, well, what assistance has the financial firm provided to the consumer? Is that reasonable? Is that fair in all the circumstances of the case? Uh, and where it isn't, then we're able to do something about that. Great. And, and what percentage of AFSCO's cases are related to consumers with unsustainable debt levels? Have you seen that just, change over time uh, with the expansion of consumer lending in Australia? So just over 9% over the last three years has been uh, people in financial hardship, financial difficulty. Um, and the sorts of things we're dealing with there will be um, home loans, there'll be personal loans, there'll be credit cards. But increasingly, we're also seeing issues with fintechs, with buy now, pay later providers uh, and new entrants to the market as well. Um, in terms of the trends, we actually, interestingly, have seen a reduction in the last uh, 18 months uh, during COVID. But a lot of that is because of um, government support measures that have been in place and also the major lenders, the major banks have put in place deferrals of loans in many circumstances during the COVID period. We're concerned though what happens as interest rates rise around the world, including in Australia, um, because we, we know that many people are heavily indebted uh, and we anticipate that there's going to be more har financial hardship on the way. And as we can see in so many countries around the world, including Australia, inflation increasing as well is really squeezing um, uh, family, um, um, family, uh, family's abilities really to pay for essentials. So we know that there's going to be more financial difficulty, not less as we move forward, sadly. Yes, and what, so what's a typical consumer debt case that you might see at AFCA? Well, it will be the sorts of matters that I've talked about, really. It will be, uh, um, it will be uh, difficulty in paying uh, for essentials, so difficulty in paying for uh, home loans, people with multiple debts. Uh, we also see a lot of issues around relationship breakdown, that increasingly we are seeing more people use um, fintechs and online uh, products without necessarily understanding um, how they operate and in some circumstances as well there, there isn't the same level of regulation of some of these um, entities so we can see all sorts of difficulty one one of the big challenges that we've had in Australia and I'm sure has been happening around the world has been an, a real increase in scams as well scamming activity um, and we've seen, including many vulnerable people, uh, losing what, what money they had um, through various scams. That could be romance scams, investment scams, all sorts of things. Uh, and that can be incredibly difficult. And before Africa was established, uh, where did financial consumers get help? Well, there were different uh, ombudsman schemes before AFCA. So there have been ombudsman schemes in Australia for about 30 years. Um, and they were established originally by different parts of uh, the financial services industry as an alternative to going to court. But the, the financial limits were quite low on the matters that they could consider. Uh, and not all of them had the ability as well to make um, uh, enforceable determinations. So uh, sometimes people would go to court, sometimes people would go to the predecessor bodies. Uh, since 2008, there has been a fund, there was a financial ombudsman service which covered much of the financial services sector, but there were still two other schemes. So there was still a bit of shopping around by industry. Uh, and government thought that that was confusing for consumers. There should be one place that people should go. Uh, and it should be a requirement as well on financial firms that they have to be a member of AFCA and they have to play by those rules. Right. Uh, just interestingly, what is the jurisdictional limit? So we can consider a matter between a, a, a consumer and a financial firm if the amount in dispute is uh, uh, up to one million dollars, uh, one million Australian dollars, and we can make awards of just over half a million dollars um, on a single issue. Um, if it is a small business owner, and we also can take complaints from small businesses, and that's any business that employs less than 100 people, about 5% of the complaints we deal with relate to business disputes. There we can consider credit matters up to $5 million and can make awards 
of up to a million or two million, depending on the type of business. That are binding. Uh, that are binding. So it's as a result of the contract that we have with the financial firm. So if we make a determination, uh, and we do that on about 6% of matters, most matters we are able to resolve, but on about 6% of matters, they go through to an ombudsman. We make a finding. If the consumer accepts that finding, then the financial firm is contractually bound to honor that and to make that payment. Uh, if the consumer doesn't accept the finding, that's fine. They can walk away and there's no uh, consequence for them. They can pursue the matter through alternative routes. Uh, and the service is entirely free for consumers and small business owners. Uh, it's paid for by the financial firms uh, who have to be members and have to pay the fees. And we've noted that Africa has a data queue. Could you tell us a bit more about that and how you analyze and use the data to strengthen consumer protection? Certainly. Well, we think it's really important that we put information out about uh, the disputes that we're seeing. Um, and we want to inform consumers, uh, but we also want to inform and work with industry as well. Um, so since we've been operating, we've uh, awarded uh, $757 million to consumers and about 250 million Australian dollars as well as being secured in terms of repayments through remediations. Um, and you can go to our website and you can see the interactive data cube. And what that is really is a tool that enables anybody, any member of the public or any financial firm to go in and see what type of complaints is AFCA receiving, either about an individual firm, named firm, and how does that compare to other firms, other insurers or other banks or other credit providers? Um, and also to have a look at a particular issue. So you can go in and look at financial hardship, for example, and you can see what kinds of disputes AFCA is handling about financial hardship, where they are resolving. If they're going through to decision, then you can see how many are going in favor of consumers or in favor of the financial firm. And you can compare financial firms. What we also do is we publish, uh, unless there are very exceptional reasons, we publish every determination that we make and we name the financial firm in those decisions as well. So again, you can go to the AFCA website. We don't name the consumers. They're anonymized for consumers for obvious reasons, but we name the financial firms as well. Another thing we've just recently launched is a um, a live dashboard for all financial firms where they can not only track their cases and see how they're performing, but they can see how they're performing against all their peers as well. We've got some great takeaways there, David. So thank you very much for, for spending the time uh, to be with us on World Consumer Rights Day and uh, keep up the good work. Into it with my. Well. Great. Um, thanks for that. And uh, if there's any consumer advocates out there, I know we're at a consumer conference um, and uh, perhaps someone might want to take Jamie's mobile phone carrier to, uh, to David. Uh, or in fact, we have our very own uh, ombudsman sitting on our panel today. But I thought I'd give you a quick rundown into some of uh, our amazing panelists today. We've got um, Mahalta Mpalele, who is the Consumer Goods and Services Ombudsman from South Africa. Her office is an alternative dispute resolution scheme that mediates disputes between suppliers of goods and services and their customers. She's an accredited court annex mediator and a registered debt counselor. Um, next up, we have Tina Tran. She's the General Counsel at Upsolve in the US. Tina Tran is the managing uh, attorney and product manager for Upsolve, the largest consumer bankruptcy nonprofit in the US. Before joining the leadership team at Upsolve, Tina ran her own consumer bankruptcy practice, which she started at the age of 28, defending debtors, trying to get back on their feet against aggressive and predatory lenders and debt collectors. She believes in keeping the law simple and making it accessible for everyday people facing credit lawsuits, wage, wage garnishments, 
bank account freezes, uh, foreclosures, and repossessions. So just your everyday superhero. Um, next, we have um, Amol Kulkarni, who is the Director of Research at CUTS, Consumer Unity and Trust Society. Um, CUTS International is a global independent nonprofit consumer facing public policy research and advocacy organization headquartered in India. He works at the intersection of evidence and policy with the objective of bridging the gap between the two, thereby making policies in emerging economies responsive and responsible particularly in areas of financial inclusion, digital financial services, payments, technology, um, among others. So he's very qualified to speak uh, today on some of those topics. Um, Julia Blow is a former legal counsel at Advocate in Sierra Leone. She's a barrister and solicitor at the High Court of Sierra Leone. Julia is a proud feminist and human rights advocate. And over the years, she served as the Secretary General of the Sierra Leone Human Rights Clinic, an international forum for education, dialogue, and debate on human rights and the rule of law. Um, also as the legal assistant for Prison Watch Sierra Leone, a UNDP funded legal aid project to reform prison conditions. And um, most recently as the legal officer for Advocate, an amazing organization um, in, and the only organization in West Africa to provide holistic access to justice via free legal representation, education, empowerment, um, and detainee support to reintegrate them into society. Currently, she is the principal legal officer for the Financial Intelligence Unit, and she's also a member of the Legal Access Through Women Yearning for Equal Rights and Social Justice, or lawyers, um, as they're uh, better known. Um, Next, we have Leonard Obura Alu, a commercial law lecturer at the University of Nairobi. He also practices, um, he also, uh, practices law uh, in, in Nairobi and is, has his own uh, practice. His research interests are in the area of international trade law, alternative dispute resolution, and the confluence between citizenship, dispute resolution, and commercial law, especially within regional trade areas and he serves on GALA's advisory board. So if we can start with you, Mikhalta. Um, welcome, firstly, um, and thank you for, for uh, coming on board. Um, so we've just heard David Locke uh, from AFCA, um, which has a specific mandate to help financial consumers with their disputes, um, with financial institutions, and to help consumers in debt distress. Can you tell me what's the South African experience with that? And how do the systems in South Africa, what systems do, does it have in place to help the debt distressed? Uh, I would say that uh, South Africa, unlike the, the, the countries that Jeremy presented is, is highly regulated. Um, we have the National Credit Act, uh, which uh, regulates uh, all types of credit. Everybody in South Africa who provides credit has to register with the National Credit Regulator. And there are rules around uh, origination of debt uh, and uh, the prevention of over indebtedness. This includes a uh, prohibition of reckless lending so all credit providers are required to conduct an affordability assessment. Uh, and that process is also prescribed. They have to look at the income, the expenses. They have to look at the credit bureau report that looks at the debt levels of the consumer. And where a consumer is not able to pay before a creditor can, can, can start with legal enforcement, there is a step that they need to follow where they issue what we call a section 129 letter, which would require them to, uh, a consumer then has various options. Uh, they can go to an private entities, which are debt counselors that are registered with the regulator and they are responsible for consolidating the debt and negotiating reduced installments. Uh, but there the can also be informal negotiations with the creditor and they are required to assist uh, consumers. If a loan is found to be reckless, the, it can be written off and the consumer doesn't have to, to pay it back. 
When it comes to disputes, there are private entities, alternative dispute resolution agents that are registered with the NCR as well. But you also have different types of ombudsmen. Uh, we have a credit ombud, we have a banking services ombud, we have uh, ombuds for long-term, short-term insurance that are responsible, that are industry funded, but there is a general requirement for industry to belong to those ombud schemes and they are responsible for assisting with the resolution of disputes for free. Great, thanks, Nkata. That sounds very much like um, the, what um, Australia had before APTA yeah. was an evolutionary process. And mm. um, perhaps um, it'll be interesting to see where South Africa goes um, from here. Um, Amol, perhaps we can come to you next. Um, Thank you for coming on board. How easy is it uh, for poor Indian borrowers to obtain digital loans? Um, and uh, is the situation with digital loans comparable to the era of microcredit that we saw uh, previously in India? Sure, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you for uh, allowing me to participate in this discussion. I hope you can hear me clearly. Okay, great. So uh, I think it's both easy as well as difficult for vulnerable consumers in India to get digital loans. Uh, difficult uh, because uh, usually poor consumers do not have the ability to access smartphones which are required for digital loans. There are real barriers to own uh, and operate a digital te technology. Also, they do not have the required collaterals to be able to be eligible for borrowing. Uh, while there are some instances or increasingly there are instances of cash flow based lending, uh, but still uh, that is yet to reach the imagination of public. So we are seeing a lot of barriers in terms of genuine borrowers wanting to benefit from digital loans, but not being able to do so. However, having said that, it's also very easy to a certain extent to get digital loans. Recently, the Indian uh, regulator, the Reserve Bank of India, did a study on digital lending, and it found that around 1,100 apps were there, uh, which provided easy digital loans to consumers in India. Most of these loans are given to those consumers who already have that uh, in some form access to formal financial services. But more surprisingly, around 600 of these apps were found to be illegal. They were not complying with the regulatory standards which are prescribed in the country for digital lending. As a result of which, what we are seeing in India is that uh, in my name, if I am unable to get a loan by misuse of my personal details and information, the illegal lender will provide will provide a loan to a third party, but my credit score will go down. So some of these illegal digital lending practices are very common in India. As a result of which, consumers are in real distress. For all the last three years, uh, on an average, 5,000 consumers have, have committed suicide because of over uh, and uh, lack of debt relief. 5,000 uh, suicides per year is an average in India. This is a recorded uh, data placed in the lower house of the Indian parliament. Uh, in addition to that, uh, what we are seeing uh, is that history often uh, rhymes if it does not repeat. So when you ask the question about Indian microfinance lending, yes, the situation is similar to what was there before, but it's not exactly comparable. Uh, there are a lot of lenders targeting uh, poor consumers or a category of poor consumers, but still a lot of people are left behind. Uh, uh, there are lack of uh, grievance redress or debt relief uh, mechanisms in India. While <clears throat> corporate insolvency 
and firm level insolvency and bankrupt bankruptcy is recognized in india there is provision for recognition of individual bankruptcy in the indian law but still it is not yet operate operational as yet we are still uh, waiting for it uh, to get operation however there are laws to put borrowers behind bars there is a, a, a legislation dating 140 years back of 1881 which provides for uh, initiation of criminal cases against uh, check bouncing cases and lot of people uh, small have have gone behind bars for default of, of on their loans or bouncing of their checks uh, and while there are some innovations which are happening around this space a lot of startups are coming to mediate uh, or provide alternate and uh, online dispute resolution mechanisms but at a large scale they are yet to uh, make a difference uh, i can go on but for us i'll just stop here and i can come back when in the next round thank you so much Yes, thanks, thanks, Amol. That's um, really um, it's it's disheartening to hear the um, in terms of the suicide rates, um, but also um, you know, this this colonial legacy of of debt incarceration just has to stop, and that is part of our campaign. We need to abolish debt incarceration. Um, so, but uh, Tina. I'd like to come to you now because perhaps you've got a little bright spot to shine on all this. Upsolve is uh, it's an amazing organization um, and, and what it's achieved. And I really like the listeners to know a little bit more about, about, about this because it's a really good example of how what I like, what I really like about it is it's an example of how law tech uh, has come in to clean up the mess that fintechs left behind. And um, and and you know, tell us a bit more about um, about Upsolve and its unique approach to making debt relief accessible to the poorer segments of uh, the U.S. Uh, society. Thank you, Joe. Um, I'm really happy to be here and glad, very grateful for this opportunity to speak with all of you. Um, but Upsolve. Uh, the organization that I am a part of. Um, we're a nonprofit organization in the US. Um, we have created a web application for people um, who are overwhelmed with debt in America um, that helps guide them through the bankruptcy process so that they can obtain um, the relief that they are looking for. Um, one, so the reason why Upsolve was started what is because um, in America, we, we do have these laws that are meant to protect consumers and to give them, uh, give consumers who are saddled with overwhelming debt a form of relief um, in order to um, <clears throat> get their debts discharged and then re enter the economy that way. The problem we found is that to access these laws, um, it's all through the bankruptcy court system, which is difficult for many people, for the everyday person to access. Um, the, they're very discouraged from, um, from going, going through the process of filing for bankruptcy without hiring a lawyer. And the issue with hiring a lawyer in America to access um, these laws and their rights um, is that lawyers, charge uh, upwards of $2,000 per bankruptcy case. And for many of Americans and many of the people filing for bankruptcy, we know that they're already struggling financially and don't have just $2,000 to pay an attorney. Um, and the forms themselves uh, in order to file are filled with legal jargon. They're very complicated and complex. Um, so what we've done at Upsolve is create this web application that helps people, that guides people through um, without the need to have to pay um, an expensive lawyer. Uh, and for example, one of the people we've helped, um, Alyssa Pratt, who is actually currently on our board right now, um, when she came across Upsolve, she had, she was experiencing uh, 
financial abuse from her previous spouse um, who took out credit in her name. Um, she was unemployed at the time and really struggling financially. Um, and uh, due to, after having used the Upsolve software to file, um, she's now in a much better place. Her credit score has increased dramatically. Um, she now runs her own nonprofit and is able to give back to um, the community and is just doing so much better. And we're uh, very, we're very grateful for, for the opportunity to be able to help people like Alyssa Pratt. That's great, uh, Tina. Um, yeah, I mean, having having uh, worked with legal aid uh, for a while um, in the past, I, I know the sorts of issues. And these issues are universal. It doesn't matter whether you're in you know, Michigan or, or Kenya or um, Australia. It's always, uh, you know, it's, it's the lawyer's fees uh, that, that really um, is something that, that seems to be a a big obstacle, um, and really, this this app has has really made a great dent on that. So, uh, congratulations! Um, Thank you. If we could go to Julia, I'm looking forward to this because Julia, you are one of the few people who have actually practiced and defended a lot of these people who have. You know, they, I mean, Sierra Leone is one of the jurisdictions that does still have debt incarceration. And I know, uh, you know, during your time at Advocate, you did a lot of these cases. So how, can you give us a bit of insight um, and share with us what the situation is in Sierra Leone with regard to the poor who are also over indebted and, uh, and have defaulted on their microloans? Um, hello, everybody. It's good to be here. Um, let me quick, quickly give you all a background as to what operates in Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone still operates with the Lassini Act of 1916. This was an act that we inherited from the British, um, our colonial um, masters at the time. And this was an act that was enacted in the 19th century during the Industrial Revolution. Um, it's an act that has um, crimes like fraudulent conversion, obtaining money on the false pretenses, and various are really not applicable in this current age and time, given the huge and massive outcry that is all over the world today for the respect for human rights. Also, given the fact that Sierra Leone is a signatory to a host of international regulations, but it's sad that we're still um, operating these legislations. It's also um, very difficult and precarious circumstances for especially women in Sierra Leone. So about 45% of the illiterate women in Sierra Leone engage in petty trading. And for their petty trading um, activities, they normally seek loans to be able to fund their businesses. And these loans are mostly gotten from either micro, mostly from microfinance institutions, maybe a fellow petty trader, um, maybe somebody of a high standing in the community who basically they'll go to to ask for some um, pre funds to be able to fund their financial business activities. So the legal or regulatory framework of our country is one where immediately um, a woman of that nature, let's say, for example, a petty trader has gone to somebody, let's say a microfinance um, institution, signed a microfinance agreement. Mind you, this person is an illiterate. She has definitely no idea of what she's signing up for. She's just giving a portion to sign. And because of the precarious circumstances in which she might find herself in, and she badly needs the money. She really is not really concerned about the legalese or whatever is included in that document. And only for maybe for her to um, renege on one payment date, or let's say the interest rates can be so absurd. And later on, she comes back to start paying only for her to find out that she has to maybe put 30% interest rate on the 
money that she was um, loaned. And these women end up being brought to the judicial system under these two crimes, fraudulent conversion, obtaining money under false pretenses. And the elements of these crimes are really not were not made for debt related offenses. These are crimes where criminals with the intention to defraud engage in fraudulent practices to gain money from people. But then these crimes to date are being used to punish innocent um, business women who are engaged in the business of just making ends meet for their families. To be honest, every day, each and every day, women are being incarcerated for petty offenses such as fraudulent conversion and obtaining money under false pretenses. But every day there's another woman, hundreds of women possibly signing new microfinance agreements, taking loans, taking monies, because the situation is really dire here. And the fact that most of these women would tell you that I don't really have an option is sometimes very difficult because even whilst in advocate, we explore the opportunity of preventing these circumstances from happening even before they do happen. But the difficulty that we got with that was they would tell you that I don't really have another choice. I don't have um, any other option if you have another option that you want to give me, but I'm taking this loan. And only for these institutions to come back and hit them um, unnecessarily. So one of the advocacy strategies we've really tried to push for is for alternative dispute resolution mechanisms to be put in place. I mean, these are debt related offenses. There are payment plan options for these women. And for most of them, it's not really about repaying the sum that they took is about the interest rates that is really killing. Because most of them will tell you that I have the money here, but then the microfinance institution will tell you that no, um, our interest rate states that this amount or this percentage of interest should be added to the sum that was taken. So this is the difficulty and this is the challenge that is in our legal and regulatory um, framework currently. And it's even more, much more difficult when our, our um, correctional centers are flooded with cases like these. You, a, a woman can be, can be imprisoned maybe five to six years for maybe um, an amount that is less than $300. So you get to understand the propensity of the, the importance of, of having these laws being um, moved away from our system, um, having newer and better ways of solving debt related issues because with time there is going to it's going to get to the point where our correctional centers cannot handle the amount or the influx of cases or um, persons that are incarcerated every day. And unfortunate circumstances, even sometimes the pre-trial detention period for some of these women is pre preposterous because you can have pre-trial um, periods that can span up to anywhere between eight to three years just for cases of sums that could be anywhere between 50 to $300 or even less. And it's, it's disheartening, it really is disheartening. And it's, it's very good that we have this platform where we all discuss these things because sometimes we, and the funny thing is we do, we passed a Consumer Protection Act in 2020, this would interest you to know, but then the fact that the last in the act of 1916 is still operational in Sierra Leone, the Consumer Protection Act really has less effectiveness um, percentages because as long as the Lassini Act is still in force, it's still being used. And even with the police prosecutors, the knowledge as to having, because most times the funny thing is the prosecutors are mostly concerned about the people that make the complaints, not about the people that are being complained or they don't look at the circumstances surrounding the complaints of unpaid loans. And the moment they get a complaint, the first step they'll probably take is, oh, we're going to charge for fraudulent conversion, obtaining money under false pretenses. So Joe, these are really the 
circumstances, the harsh realities that are on ground in Sierra Leone. Mm. And some of these women are mostly the breadwinners of their families. And they have kids who, single mothers mostly, that are dependent on them. Okay, great. So just very quickly, just to follow up on that, what I'm curious to know is, is there a gendered aspect to this? Are you, have you seen particularly what we are seeing in a lot of, of, of developing countries is that when you put certain ingredients together, for example, um, a largely informal e economy um, and a major stressor, a shock like COVID, um, when you put those two ingredients together, you're going to get lots and lots of defaults. Um, one thing I'm curious about is, did you see an increased number of prosecutions or uh, charges being laid? Um, and did you see a, dispar a disproportionate impact on women? Because most, if, if you're saying that it's mostly microfinance institutions that are enforcing this, most, a lot of the microfinance institutions are targeting women. So, um... Since the um, outbreak of the COVID um, in um, late 2019 and early 2020, we have actually seen a massive increase in these cases, mainly due to the fact that a lot of institutions, a lot of companies had to let go of their staff. Um, most of these women were um, um, low staff workers, for example, cleaners, um, office messengers, and they were um, let go in most of these institutions. So they mostly had to run back to option B or plan B, which they think is having a loan and starting a business. And then um, the enforcement of, of, of um, microfinance institutions, really, they target women. So for the most part, in fact, most of their schemes will tell you that the essence or the aim or the motive of their scheme is to help enrich or help develop the lives of women in, in a particular area or particular community. But then it turns out that the whole gimmicks of all their plans is really having, because women are vulnerable and much more weaker. And I mean, a woman always tries to, um, the, the basic instinct would be um, I'm in debt and I, and I had to um, get this covered. And for what would interest you to know also is that for some of these women, they even take these loans on behalf of their husbands. So the husbands would actually push the women to go and take the loan and then they would come and give them the money only for them to come um, and be held responsible for actions that um, they, they, they perpetrated in, in good faith, basically. And then... Um, then you have a system that is really not that gender sensitive, because to be honest, thinking of a woman that has five children, maybe the youngest being an eight month old baby, and, and she's busy sucking that baby. And then you have that woman incarcerated for two, four years for a crime that basically all what the court really needs to do is have a payment plan or payment option because for sometimes most of these women also have um, relatives who we could explore opportunities because most of what we used to do is try to reach out to relatives of these women and try to explore opportunities of having them come on board and work on a payment plan. But let me tell you the difficulty with those um, 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 systems that we try to put in just place. Just very quickly, Julia, because we've got to just go on to the next uh, speaker. Sorry. So, so the microfinance institutions basically aim to, to um, serve a deterrence purpose. So they're mostly um, adverse to having these um, payment plan options. They'll tell you that they want to set an example. And so really that's what happens. Okay, great. Um, Leonard, uh, if we could come to you um, and this is also a very interesting aspect because we're going to turn to you're a um, you're a Kenyan, and we all know that Kenya has uh, made leaps and bounds in terms of you know uh, the uh, digital finance market. Um, so uh, it's um, it's a particularly interesting country for us, and and that's why it's going to be the first country in our series that we're um, starting with. Um, so. Um, you know, we want to explore some of the digital finance services, the financial consumer protection mechanisms available, given the dynamic nature and the explosive growth of the sector. And you know, I, 
I, you know, we completely acknowledge that uh, financial inclusion and digital finance has brought a lot of benefits to you know, large swathes of, of, of the population. We're really looking at that minority that are, you know, that's at the bottom. And the ones who are living close to poverty, you will tip into poverty if we don't have you know, appropriate safeguards. So can you explain the legal concept, uh, legal landscape, I should say, to us with regard to financial consumer protection in Kenya? And what specifically is the Central Bank of Kenya's new mandate with regard to the digital lenders? Because um, you know, there's been some recent laws passed uh, in, in December on that. Um, and are there any other car uh, regulators that have a role to play um, in, in financial consumer protection in Kenya? Um, yes, um, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Um, in, indeed, uh, the Kenyan uh, landscape for first mobile money uh, transfer has been an enormous gain for the uh, country. Um, 15 years ago, um, access to uh, money transfer was a big problem before the mobile uh, money platforms came on. And I think many of your um, the listeners and the people who are uh, logged on today will know about the M-Pesa uh, uh, mobile money transfer system that came in 2007. Now, initially, the, the approach was maybe to have less regulation. And if, if it had been very regulatory, uh, the mobile money platform may not have taken off in Kenya. So the focus was maybe less regulation to balance between the regulation and allowing the sector to grow. Uh, so there was indeed growth of mobile money. But the criticism even then was that mobile money transfer is not access to financial services. And perhaps in reply to this, or maybe because of just innovation, the mobile money companies came up uh, with different platforms, including um, the mobile digital lending platforms uh, from 2012. So there've been about 10 years of digital lending uh, platforms in the country. And they have grown. And in, indeed, I would say that maybe the digital lending platforms um, are less troublesome in some sense for, than uh, going to the money lenders. There's less humiliation. Um, it is you and the, your mobile phone, you seek the loan, uh, you get it. So there's some advantages that could be claimed for it. Uh, however, um, there were problems that um, did occur. And these, I think, from uh, the study Jamie and her colleagues are doing will probably come out and people would read about those. But some of the things that can obviously be seen are predatory lending practices. Um, there was mobile betting where people would borrow money to uh, then place on uh, bets also using their mobile phones, um, high rates of default, um, of course, the uh, interest rates that sometimes would look usury in their nature, a lack of transparency, and of course, um, a vicious cycle of borrowing where um, a borrower borrows from one platform, goes to another, to, uses that to pay, etc. And then, of course, there's one, the power of data in terms of these uh, blenders have a lot of data. Um, so what then um, is the legal re regulatory regime? Uh, we are fortunate in this country in that Article 46 of our constitution actually provides for consumer protection. That uh, may be a rare one uh, around the world that it is a constitutional mandate to have consumer protection in the country. Um, there are other uh, protections, uh, the, uh, the Competition Act, um, the Consumer Protection Act, Microfinance Act, the Information and Communications Act, which is to govern mobile phones, but also deals with aspects of consumer protection. Um, digital protect, uh, digital uh, data protection statutes recent from 2019 to protection of data. Of course, betting, uh, lotteries and gaming statutes, uh, which predate uh, the mobile money platforms, but would also protect things from things like gaming and statutes such as the consumer um, computer misuse and cyber crimes statutes. But all these you'd see are scattered all over the place. Uh, now the Central Bank of Kenya Act was amended last year to include specific provisions to license uh, these digital lending platforms and include also specific provisions for consumer protection of the digital lending uh, platforms. Uh, the central bank has uh, uh, central bank has set out regulations which are now for public comment. 
Um, the public comment period will end in March, which will cover many aspects of uh, these uh, consumer uh, protection and also animal laundering, the licensing governance issues around uh, the digital lending platforms. The thing, however, though, is whether uh, these would be utilized and whether there's an escalation of the complaints mechanisms through this. I, I see some use that may be found from uh, the central bank regulations looking at areas such as what we've heard from Australia and what is being in, done in South Africa so that there is one point. And indeed on our platform, there has been discussion about alternative justice systems, some comments about alternative justice systems. I think those are good. The only danger, however, is that we cannot scatter the places where you point consumers to, which has been the uh, current position. Um, I think I'd stop there, and uh, I think uh, much can be read about it and in the comments that Jamie will have in the paper that she'll present. Thank you. Great. Thanks, thanks very much, uh, Leonard, for that, that really um, very relevant snapshot of what's happening uh, in the... Um, now I can see we've got we're doing uh, we've got twenty minutes left. I'm thinking rather than go through a round of, of questions uh, for with everyone that maybe we can uh, just have a discussion um, amongst ourselves. Otherwise, I can go back to um, uh, some of the questions that we've got um, here, um, or maybe there might be some questions from the audience. Um, has someone been manning the chat box, uh, Jamie? Have, have you seen anything there? Otherwise, I've got a question for Leonard. Um, and um, so uh, you made a very interesting point, actually, at, at the end about not having a dispersed kind of scattergun approach. Um, and when I was looking at some of the um, alternative, it, it seems that Kenya is a bit light, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but in terms of you know, some of the ADR schemes, um, you know, debt mediation and debt counseling as well, um, and financial literacy, and some of the more preventative aspects, um, that that was uh, not as present um, given the size of Kenya, uh, relative to its size, than say in South Africa. And, you know, um, I, because I see some opportunities here. Um, we at A4ID have you know, lawyers, and that's part of our job to enlist lawyers and to develop a culture of pro bono um, here in Kenya. We have a, an African lead um, here, and we're always looking for ways, um, for example, with uh, university clinics um, to start getting that, you know, because pro bono really has to start at the university level at a very young age to be able to inculcate that culture in the legal, in the legal um, culture. I mean, it's, it's developed over a long time uh, in, in the West. But, um, so, but these are some of the things you know, we're thinking about at A4ID, um, getting, getting universities um, to start up legal clinics, like debt clinics, uh, for example, um, to start looking at these things. Um, Namati, for example, could, could uh, train a whole army of debt mediators. Um, that's another thing I was thinking about. But um, I, I know your, your, your word of caution there about not, uh, not having a scattergun approach. So we're still going to be thinking uh, quite considerably about this. Um, but I think there is some scope there. Um, and, and I'm just... Hand it over to you for your thoughts. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, yes, indeed, I, I agree uh, fully that there is room to work with universities. Um, some years ago, uh, I was involved with the establishment of what we termed a transactional legal clinic with funding from the International Development Law Organization, IDA Law. The idea behind a transactional legal clinic is that most of the time, the sorts of clinics that we have, uh, and forgive me, I'll try and put this carefully, deal with people with problems and not business people say for example so assisting business people start up their business so to encourage university students to get involved in the business end of legal aid the small trader just needs a little assistance in that direction 
Yes, of course, if they then get indebted, they, there could be room for uh, utilization of alternative justice systems, even if through legal clinics. Uh, there is, however, a slight danger, which I must, and this must be felt all across the world, and I would be interested to hear about the views, is that you cannot take legal work from lawyers. Otherwise, then the schemes are fought. And I think maybe uh, my colleagues uh, elsewhere who've had it may just comment on, on that. Well, I, I, I'll just quickly say in response to that, um, what if the lawyers aren't doing that work? Because it's, uh, you know, it, it's poverty law, right? And, and you don't make a lot of money out of poverty law. So, um, you know, um, if, if, if there is a lacuna there in terms of people who are wanting to go into the, you know, to help these people, then we've, we've got to go to the next step. And, and there's a whole, you know, army of law students there, um, all properly supervised, of course, by, um, uh, but Julia, did you have anything to add to that? I mean, you've worked a lot uh, with civil society and, and... Um, It's a very interesting point. And um, I think I'm going to tow Leonard's line. Um, taking away the functions and um, trying to ascribe them to, uh, let's say law students, for example, is going to be a systemic rebellion and it's going to face very tough, um, very tough opposition from um, well ingrained and established systems. Um, for, for us, for example, even paralegals find it very difficult to do their work because you, you're in a system where um, it's even difficult for, let's say, a magistrate or a judge to listen to you. And the first question mostly would be, um, what year were you called to the bar? Um, which chambers or which firm are you working for? So it's 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 very difficult. And what 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 could possibly happen is they could help to give to spread the awareness, to give knowledge. But when it comes to um, help or um, helping in in the court system or the legal framework, I I don't think that would that would basically. Um, be possible given the current nature of a legal system, especially in Africa. Right. It's very closed and tight knit. Right, yes, uh, I got your point. What about, say, at the ADR stage, like, before it became a huge problem and had to go to court? What if you know you had inter early intervention uh, sort of dispute resolution systems? Right? So the early intervention can be done at the police stations, even be before the matter is charged to court. So for the work that Advocate does, most times we have our paralegals mostly go to the police stations and do police station monitoring. And then we have to um, intervene even before these matters are charged to the court, because the moment they cross over to the court, their jurisdiction is minimal or none at all. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about even before it gets to the police station, um, you know, so uh, we're talking debt counselling here, um, increased financial literacy um, uh, for people living in close, in or close to poverty. These sorts of uh, schemes to help uh, help people who are distressed but can turn around um, at that very early stage before it gets to um, a huge problem. But anyway, so that, basically, that's people. Sorry, sorry. People who are distressed, um, mostly, you, you, they will only seek your help when it gets to the point where they're charged or they're um, invited to the police station. So it's very difficult for, let's say, um, a lender or borrower to come and meet you for debt counseling. So, and it's also very difficult for um, a creditor to come and meet you for counseling when they feel like they don't need it. They only come for services when they're in distress or they think that they need it. And that's mostly when um, they have been brought to court for, for a case. Right. Um, Amal, if I could turn to you, um, could you speak a bit more about the, um, the, the dispute resolution uh, or complaints uh, redress mechanisms in India? Um, so does the Reserve Bank of India, for example, have a financial ombudsman or some other ADR mechanism uh, to help to assist debt distressed Indians. 
Sure, thank you for that question. And uh, just before answering that, I was hearing this very interesting conversation about helping people in distress, sort of reaching out to them and uh, and uh, hel giving a helping hand. I think uh, we, we need to sort of uh, come up to away with sort this sort of position that we are trying to help these people. These people are very good financial managers because they know how to survive with minimal resources and how to sort of make their daily uh, uh, daily ends meet. And they are trying to figure out anything and everything which can help their children go to school or which can help them uh, uh, earn to uh, uh, score meals in a day. And therefore, I think let's not uh, uh, let's not uh, consider them as financially illiterate or people who do not know much in terms of how to navigate the complex uh, system. Uh, they are equally sort of uh, uh, empowered, so to speak of, uh, if given an opportunity. And, and with that sort of uh, considering them as equal partners in financial inclusion uh, journey or, uh, or uh, financial development would be the right way to look at the, this sort of poor, uh, but yet very financially sound uh, uh, population. They do not make uh, decisions in in uh, uh, sort of uh, in lieu, uh, uh, but they do a lot of calculations to uh, uh, take their decisions with respect to debt, uh, and they often do not have many options. So let's talk about those. Uh, financial service providers who are unable to design their products and services to meet the requirements of these uh, poor uh, 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 people. As a result of which, uh, these uh, individuals or borrowers uh, have to uh, borrow a standardized uh, uh, at, at standardized rates and which results in over interviews. But having said that, uh, Reserve Bank of India does have an Ombudsman uh, 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 policy, uh, and recently, so we had uh, uh, banking ombudsman and non-banking ombudsman and online ombudsman, but all of it was sort of collaborate, uh, was sort of uh, merged into one, and we have an integrated ombudsman scheme in India. However, the 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 catch here is that you can only approach an ombudsman if there is a deficiency in service. And uh, own indebtedness or debt relief is not necessarily a deficiency in service as per Indian uh, <clears throat> uh, legal requirements. If it is, uh, if it is merged or if it is read along with uh, unsuitable uh, practices or unregulated practices, then uh, there might be some scope, but still, uh, it's not yet considered as a deficiency in service, and you may not be in a position to approach ombudsman. Secondly, uh, before approaching an ombudsman, you need to file a complaint with the service provider and you need to wait for a prescribed time period. It, and in case the, you do not uh, get the desired resolution, only then uh, you need to approach the ombudsman, which is not really the best way uh, to resolve people, uh, uh, pe uh, resolve uh, debt. I was hearing some suggestions about the centralized uh, 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 dispute resolution mechanism, but in our experience, the more uh, the mechanism that consumers have, uh, both in terms of formal and informal mechanisms, the better it is, because usually centralized mechanisms do not work in a large uh, geography like India. Uh, there are a lot of <clears throat> innovations which are happening uh, through the consumer movement and also startups which are operating in India, uh, there is a startup by the name Just Act, which is uh, providing uh, debt uh, uh, mediation and and uh, uh, reconciliation services. Uh, there is a legally recognized uh, mechanism uh, by the name NALSA, uh, which is uh, something called as Common Code, wherein on a daily basis thousands of debt-related disputes are being resolved and relief is being given to individual uh, borrowers, but that is not enough because that meets once in a month, uh, but the cases are happening on a daily 
if not on a hourly basis and people are uh, uh, sort of uh, 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 taking their kids out of school because of lack of funds or they are doing away with one meal a day because of lack of funds so this, this is a very real uh, problem in and developing countries like india uh, particularly after covid which needs uh, which needs uh, urgent resolution the reserve bank of india is just talking about fair practice code and some self regulatory mechanism to address some of these issues which would not really help we need to move from a uh, uh, a buyer beware to a lender beware system and more approachable grievance address adr odr mechanism uh, to really help the consumers in distress and and stop considering them as untouchable who need our help uh, uh, because they have fallen out of favor of some financial service provider i think i'll just stop here thank you so much yeah no that that's that's interesting i mean um australia has uh gone through its own evolution and it has had voluntary schemes uh with the ombudsman um but uh obviously you know that that wasn't working because it's now gone to a much more uh, uh a, a binding scheme i was quite surprised as well uh, to hear some of the the powers that the financial ombudsman there has to make binding powers of that magnitude um that we heard um tina i'd like to come back to this idea before we close about law tech because i can see some interesting uh, discussions going on in the chat box and i thought maybe we could sort of bring this up uh within in the panel itself because the 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 idea of that that uh, your organization has come up with works obviously um really well in a first world country uh you know with um computerized court management systems um how can we translate that uh to the global south to low and middle income countries how can we scale that up if at all um do we need to have uh computerized court management systems implemented before we can go start looking into this um it, that's a, a very good question um so in in the US it's still we have not automated court filings um it's still an area where the US is considered a developing country um the process to file bankruptcy is still done very manually where um people have to fill out these extensive forms and directly take them to the bankruptcy court um and file that way so it is it's not it's we haven't found a way in the US to automate court filings yet um so in other countries i it's i don't think it's it's not a necessity um to have automated court filings um but there does need to be some sort of mechanism for debt relief where if it's if it's done through the courts or if it's done otherwise um or through some other mechanism um the way that our software works is because there are forms to fill out um we've been able to come up with a to develop this software tool that helps people fill out these forms um without the the need for an a lawyer to hire an expensive lawyer yeah yeah no uh, there isn't the um um yeah i've just got a comment here that i think new york had an e filing system didn't it um new york state uh, um, there are there are ways to to file electronically in the US um like some court systems will um accept filings by email um but it's not i don't it's not automated in the way that um that we they really think of automation mm. um but i i wanted to to also encourage um everyone else to to try and um reimagine a world where we don't have the necessity we don't to reimagine a legal system without the need for lawyers and like how can we how can we solve the problems that we have um when it comes to 
overwhelming debt uh, without the need for lawyers. Mm. Um, is, there a, is, is there room for law tech to, aside from this filing system, I mean, can anyone on the panel think of areas where we could develop a law tech uh, app? Uh, say in the dispute resolution, you know, uh, in ADR, for example, um, or to deal with, say, um, debt, debt harassment by, you know, the debt collectors. Um, I just wanted to put that out there. If anyone has any great ideas. I should say, I don't know if this was raised in, um, in Jamie's uh, section, but, we have developed this, these guidelines. Um, uh, they're guidelines for, uh, we say it's a, a human rights approach. It's still in draft. It's very much a work in progress. Um, it will be eventually a human rights and developmental approach uh, to dealing uh, with debt policy and debt relief for natural persons. Um, and one of the ideas we've had um, is uh, you know to create to elevate it to um, to sort of a soft law uh, status. Um, we've seen with uh, say the Abidjan principles um, that have been developed. You can get a a, a bunch of jurists uh, to draft a, a document, and that under the Vienna Convention on Law of Treaties becomes uh, law, soft law that's recognised in international law. And the Abidjan principles have been quoted and cited in a number of decisions around the world. And it's a sort of self-reinforcing uh, sort of mechanism. So that's one of the ideas we're thinking about with the guidelines. Um, so um, we're close to coming to an end now. Um, and I think we can probably wrap up here. Jamie, I thought, did you want to take the floor to sort of give some last uh, closing thoughts on and summaries of the of events and things we've been speaking about today. Yes, wonderful. I'm off of mute and I don't have an echo. It's good to find my voice. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of our participants. And again, thank you to Consumers International. I think um, some of the key takeaways is in a lot of countries, there's a lot of work to be done yet. There is the role for a lawyer. Um, as Tina mentioned, however, these financial con complaints be it about debt distress or be it about being mistreated by a financial services provider, they are high volume complaints and low value complaints. So there needs to be some involvement of tech or many people will be left out um, and not have any sort of access to dispute resolution. The debt issue aside is something where I think lawyers could come in and could work um, in the format of a legal aid clinic, pro bono, there's definitely a role for lawyers. Um, the problem too, as, as Julia has highlighted, there's some really old legal frameworks that are on the books. If we are serious about financial consumer protection, we need to do a full sweep of legislation and look at how every um, ad hoc piece of legislation is impacting financial consumer rights. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done. We are just starting our project and we're really, really thankful for the support of pro bono involvement in our project. For East Africa in particular, we've had support from DLA Piper affiliate law firms, and there are law firms on um, who are available and who are interested to help on a pro bono basis. The issue, of course, is you will be a favorite uh, client, but you won't necessarily be a priority client because they do have a lot of other paying clients um, who need their support. But um, we have found that they've been very, very supportive of our work and, and we couldn't do this project without them. We'd also like to call everybody's um, attention to the fact that we are still working on our draft guidelines, as Joe mentioned, and we are still working to sort out and to roll out 36 country reports um, on this issue. So if you have a particular country that you're interested in participating in the research and being engaged. We'd really love to hear from you and to have further discussions on all of these issues. So thank you again and um, happy World Consumer Rights Day. Thank you everyone.